Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to In the Work, Makers and Shakers. I'm Jan Rubenstein, Home and Design Director for Departures Magazine, and I'd like to introduce to you Lacey Schutz from the Executive Director of the Shaker Museum and Brooklyn-based designer Katie Stout. Uh, ladies, thank you so much for, for joining me today um, for this amazing talk, and I'm really excited to be here, and um, thank you to Design Miami. Um, Lacey, why don't we uh, start with you? How do you, when you when you meet someone for the first time and they just don't know the Shaker Museum or they may have a vague notion of who the Shakers were, you know, what do you, how do you describe the institution and what it is and, and what you do? Yeah, I think, I think people often know one or two things about Shakers and they tend to know that, that they made things like chairs. Uh, they, they're familiar with the oval boxes. They often know that the Shakers were celibate uh, and that's sort of a point of interest for some people. Um, but a lot of people don't know much beyond that. And um, I like to tell people that they were, they were radical progressives, that they held radically progressive values um, in regards to things like gender and race and ability and community way back at the, at the end of the 1700s in the United States. And that it's, it's a pretty remarkable story. And Katie, like, what is your first uh, memory of like learning about the Shakers, or what has your sort of journey been like in terms of understanding them? Um, I feel like my journey with Shaker design is sort of, I feel like I was introduced to it through chairs, like a lot of people. Um, I grew up with my mom had Shaker chairs around our dining room table. Um, and yeah, so I feel like I was introduced to it through this, like, lens of uh, the chairs, the uh, like the cabinets and the drawers. Um, and then I became familiar with their, more of their baskets. And then through the Shaker Museum, I learned that, um, yeah, they were like pretty fringy and doily, so. And like, when did you first connect with the museum? Like what was your, that started the whole, um, this, this sort of upcoming show that you're working on with them? I think, it, wait, is it like two months ago or three months ago? I don't know, time has lost all meaning. <laughs> it truly has. I think it was early October, so. That's right, yeah. What, that's a month and a half ago. That's um, very recently, yeah. <laughs> um, Susan Ainsworth called and asked if I wanted to do a show and I was like, or, like curate a pop-up and maybe like put one of my pieces in the show. And I was like, yes, definitely. So that is when I was introduced to Lacey. And then I, I went up like two weeks after in mid-October and got a tour of the collection. And it was really amazing and also quite surprising, um, which I'll get into later. How many, how many pieces are in the collection, Lacey? It's, um, if you really count every single little piece of paper in the archives, as well as every, you know, tool and, and every, every little bit of everything, <clears throat> it's around 18,000 objects. Wow. And like, Katie, what, what, what attracted you to doing, to doing this sort of pop-up exhibition um, with the Shakers? Like what, you know, like, I think if someone just knows your work and your more popular work, like, the, like the lady lamps and the nips and all that stuff. It might be like, what, where is this coming from? Why is these are the most two unexpected? Um, this is like a very unexpected pairing. You know, what attracted you to, to doing this? Like, you know, you obviously said yes very quickly. And so I'm sort of curious, like what was your um, point of inspiration? Like what, what, what made you latch onto the idea? Um. Hmm. Well, I've been thinking a lot about or I, what I thought at least was the shaker mentality and um, sort of aesthetic recently because I've like, I know people are like super 
So I feel like the lady lamps are my sort of like the go-to thing um, that I design and that's what people mostly know me for. But I've been working a lot in Wicker recently and um, not like a lot, but like a few larger projects, um, but they've just been like taking a long time. And I was looking at, um, you know, like American basketry, which like brought me back to Shakers. Um, and just like how they sort of like, yeah, just how they wove baskets. And then in this one specific cabinet I made, there were like these wooden pieces. And I just was like looking at the cabinets and the forms um, and how simple they are and how they introduce like elements of ornament in like kind of subtle ways that I was interested in, in experimenting with because I'm, I tend to be like more overt um, with my expressions. So that's sort of where I kind of like started exploring shaker furniture again. And, and Lisi, obviously, you know, can you put the shakers into a little bit of a historical context in terms of, you know, if they're starting in the 18th century, you know, today we think of them as American, but you know, at the time it was very radical and, and were their designs radical for the time in terms of American furniture and decorative arts as well? Or how do you, how do you think that they were perceived at the time? Of course today they look American as apple pie, but back then I'm sure it was something very different. Yeah, I think, you know, the Shakers came over from from Manchester, England in the late 18th century. And um, they were they were a Christian religious sect. They were founded by a woman um, and they came over from England and they settled um, near Albany, New York, uh, and sort of ended up uh, proliferating from there into um, New England and down south into Kentucky and west as far as Ohio. And they created these, um, these planned communities where they live together and they, they worship together. And um, I think one of the things that's interesting about the furniture uh, is that all they considered all of their labor to be part of their worship. So whether they were actually, you know, in the meeting house singing and dancing and worshiping in ways that are, are familiar to us. They also considered their work uh, in the fields or their work in the workshops making chairs. Uh, they considered that part of worshiping as well, uh, which I think is kind of a great um, way to think about all of the work that we do. Um, and, you know, there's some ways that particularly the chairs and some of the furniture just kind of look like early uh, American basic kind of farm farm furniture, but they did evolve this very beautiful spare aesthetic with a lot of the, um, a lot of the um, things that they made that turned, that I think, I think was actually quite radical, just like their beliefs were very radical. Um, and there's, you know, there's evidence that uh, in the early 20th century, that some of the people who became, you know, fundamental to the Scandinavian modern uh, furniture design movement, um, saw sort of saw a shaker chair and thought whoa <laughs> what is this um and really found it to be a very very radical um uh, piece of furniture um and katie like do you consider your work to be you know is it part of your worship like is it part of your do you like do you gain like a sort of spiritual value to yourself through your work like you think that it's it's important for your own your own immortal soul to kind of like develop these pieces and you know rather than just like something that you do um yeah definitely yeah i'd say definitely um I, it's like hard for me <laughs> to decipher like whether it's like this like compulsion or like an obsession or you know something that i like really find I do find like a lot of meaning in it and I really like working with my hands and it's sort of how I think. Um, like I feel much more confident with my hands than for instance, like having a conversation a lot of the time. Um, and it's how I, yeah, it's definitely, it's like how I cope. Um, it's how I like react to the world. Um, 
it also like keeps me grounded. I didn't have a studio for about a month and I was like so comically depressed. <laughs> and I realized it's because I didn't have a space to make work. So I can relate to that. Definitely. And how do you relate to the sort of that early kind of, you know, as Lacey was saying, the Shakers were, you know, founded by a woman. There's definitely, there's a lot of, um, you know, connections and sort of femininity in your work and their work and how it all, like, what, what do you identify with the most um, in terms of that kind of connection? Well, what I thought, I, so I didn't fully realize like how feminist um, the Shakers were until Lacey basically told me until I visited the museum. Um, like I knew that they were celibate, but I didn't realize I just like didn't make the connection between, you know, not having children and be able, being able to like have time to do other things aside from rearing children. Um, and yeah, I can, I, I so much admire the fact that women were treated equally. And there are these like amazing photos of one of the sisters like working on a lathe in the wood shop. Um, oh, I can't remember from the thirties. And uh, I love that. Like, I love that the women were like working, they were entrepreneurial. They, um, yeah, they, they were like business people and crafts people. And um, I, yeah, I think it's great. And do you see your, what kind of work, what kind of commentary are you trying to make with your own work recently in terms of like, the lady lamps and everything else like do you do you see your work as commentary on sort of feminism or the role of women women in design yeah i mean the lady lamps sort they started out as um like a commentary on object like the objectification of women by like literally turning them into household objects <laughs> um and I like wanted to make them like feel a little free and like a little lumpy and um, expressive and also kind of like if you turn away, they're just gonna like drop the lampshade and walk away. And then the women, it, like, it's evolved. And now the women- That's, that's a little terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> now the women like hold other women. And sometimes the women turn into like animals and like boundaries are just really dissolving. So. And, you know, in the, you're also producing a chair for, or two chairs, as I hear, for the pop-up. Can you explain a little bit about, um, you know, they're, they're very different than I think what I've seen of your work before. Like, can you, can you explain them? Okay, I was originally inspired by the bonnets. And so I wanted to make bonnets for chairs. And then after going to the museum and like rifling around, the collection, I was just so inspired by like the various ways that the things were made. Um, like there's this rag rug and Lacey like pulled the rag aside and we could like see that it was just like made in a way that I wasn't totally expecting. It was like really simple. And then um, I and was like sort of just like taking notes on like all of the ways that things were woven together. Um, or stitched or like pleated. And so I made these two chairs that were inspired by uh, like various ways that the shakers made things aside from chairs. Um, and they sort of just like took on a life of their own. Um, so one of the chairs is made out of this reflective fabric like safety reflective fabric. And um, that was inspired by the taffeta, taffeta, that's the word, right? The like two colored silk mm -hmm. um, that they used a lot in their clothing or in like little pin cushions. Um, and like the form is like very simple, kind of like a shaker chair. And then there are like little scraps woven into it. Um, and then the other chair is just sort of like a full bonnet bonanza. <laughs> and it's asymmetrical as well, correct? Asymmetrical, yeah. Many of your pieces are. 
Yes. Uh, yeah, definitely. Or there's like an element of asymmetry in them. Um, yeah, she's just like full bonnet with like lots of, <laughs> I don't know how else to explain her. her okay. um, but one of the other things I was super inspired by, and I really know nothing about it. So Lacey, maybe you could tell us, but the Shaker spirit writing. Mm. Because I feel like <clears throat> it re reminded me a lot about, reminded me a lot of um, surrealism and like their automatic practices where they would just be like, eyes to hand, like no brain. Um, and they would just like express themselves. So I was like trying to do with these chairs, I like tried to like get into this like trance where I was like, I can't overthink it. I just have to do it and like let the chair, like let elements just like be how they are. Um, but that was sort of like my interpretation of spirit writing and I was. Yeah, Lisa, can you explain that? Like what is, what is the, I've never heard about this. What is the sort of shaker spirit writing? Yeah, the shaker spirit writing is, um, is one of those elements that I kind of chalk up under the category of shakers, weirder than you thought. <laughs> um, the, around the, around about the 1830s, um, the shakers had, went through this era of very, very intense spiritualism. And sometimes it's called the era of manifestation. Some kind, sometimes it's called the, um, called the era of mother's work. Uh, mother being Mother Ann Lee, who was the founder of the Shakers. Um, she had, she died in the late 1700s. So by the 1830s, um, there were a lot of Shakers who didn't, hadn't met her in person. Um, you know, sort of the people who had known her personally were beginning to die off. And there was a new generation of Shakers um, who, you know, really revered Mother Anne, but didn't hadn't known her in real life, and um, and for some reason uh, during this period, and it lasted you know ten ten or more years, uh, shakers across all of the different communities started to have these um, uh, communications from the spirit world, and they would manifest in a lot of different ways. They could manifest in this kind of automatic writing that um, Katie's referring to, but they also manifested in these drawings, which are these extremely intricate, very outsider art, you know, obsessive compulsive sorts of um, sorts of things uh, that are very, very beautiful and very uncanny. Have many um, survived? Oh yeah, there's a lot of them out in the world. Um, we have some in our collection. Um, there's, there's many of them are at Hancock Shaker Village. Some of them are at the Met Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, there's a lot in private collections and there's been books written about them as well. Um, and, but sometimes also the, um, and I, I liked hearing Katie talk about feeling like she was channeling something in the making of these chairs, because sometimes these, these so-called spirit gifts would come in the form of, um, a new dance or a new song or a laughing fit, <laughs> Um, and it wasn't just Mother Anne, it was other departed um, Shaker leaders. It was, um, it was political leaders like Thomas Jefferson. Um, they would often get these spirit communications also from, um, from Native Americans, uh, which I think is a pretty interesting thing to have happening at that, at that particular moment in American history. Uh, and it, it's, 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 very, it's very fascinating and very strange. Katie, can, is there, of all the pieces that you've pulled out um, from uh, the Shaker Museum's collection for this pop-up, uh, let's review some of the things that you, some of the highlights that you really um, identify with. What's, what would be there for your first? Well, I think a good um, jumping off point would be Mother Anne's name written in spirit writing. Uh, what, what do you love about it? Well, if you refer to the stoneware jug, it sort of reminds me of the pattern on the jug and it's basically Mother Anne's name um, written as this like ornamental pattern. And it is so beautiful. And as Lacey was saying, it's like uncanny and it, it's just something you can like stare at forever. It's just like a maze of little tendrils. Um, yeah, I would say that that's something that that kind of pattern um, 
or the sort of the ornament is not something I would normally associate with Shaker, maybe because that's just not what gets shared. It's it's not furniture. It's more of a small decorative object. Um, exactly. It, it's it's also it's worth noting that um, that it's illegible. <laughs> you can't. You, you wouldn't look at it and you could never, there's no way that you would ever decipher that it says Mother Anne Lee. It's, it's in a, um, it's in some kind of spirit, spirit language that, that. Yeah. It looks like a tattoo. <laughs> it, it looks like a very, like a hipster's really cool tattoo that, that they would have on, <laughs> on the back somewhere, which was actually, <laughs> I'm just waiting for someone to, someone to, uh, to get that Mother Anne um, tattoo, Katie. That would be really good. That would be really good. <laughs> Let's move on to the. I love the, the 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 sort of pair of shoes that would be worn at a meeting. Um, Lacey, can you uh, explain um, this little um, low heeled footwear? Yes. Um, who knew that the Shakers uh, were the were the um, uh, popularizers of the kitten heel. <laughs> um, but the, the, I think, as I mentioned before, dancing and song were important parts of their, their formal worship service. And um, they would, they would almost put on a sort of uniform uh, in order to, to worship like that. And that, that color, that blue color was their deeply holy color. Um, so the men would have vests in that color and the women's the shoes were that were that color. And they're they're absolutely gorgeous um, things with hand stitched soles and they're they're, they're very, very beautiful. But also um, which is this is common in, in shoes of this era, there's no technical left or right shoe, um, which seems like it might have been really uncomfortable for dancing, but hmm. um. And Katie, what did you love about the the knit squirrel pond holder, uh, which I think is probably the most Katie Stout of all the things that we have here, um, and it is also quite adorable. So I guess when I was going through the collection, I was like so surprised to find all these little stuffed animals, um, and I just like I thought they were like entirely delightful. Lacey, tell me if I'm wrong, but. Um, she said, Lacey said that they were mostly made for sale. It's not totally something, I don't know, like, would, I don't think it was like something that's kind of like, it sounds like shaker export or. Yeah, exactly. It was shaker export. And I thought that was also really interesting because I had, I knew very little about their, um, like, ultra entrepreneurial, like, genius. Like, they were the first ones to package seeds that true and sell them um and I just thought this was the squirrel sort of encapsulates like the perfect counterpoint to what how everyone sees the shakers so I thought it was really important to include and as I was like, looking through all of the things that I picked I think everything that was sort of like the mindset behind all of the selections um just things that we don't objects that we don't totally associate with shaker design. Um, because I, I think like we've, at least I have, my introduction to shaker design has definitely been through this like modernist lens of like clean lines and purity and um, sort of like austerity. Um, well, speaking of austerity, um the bed warmer I thought was really kind of appealed to the modernist in me. Um, Lacey, what can you tell us about that piece? I, I don't know much about that piece. And I, I have to say, I had actually never laid eyes on it until Katie picked it. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, which is one of the fun things about um, having new people, seeing the, seeing the collection through, through other people's eyes is that you always, you either get a new perspective on something or you see something you never even saw in the collection before. Talk a little bit about, you know, pieces like, like the patch blue vessel and these sort of, this sort of new wave of work of yours that's come after the lady lamp, but that is more about kind of, I don't know, maybe just assembling uh, archetypes of furniture. Yeah, I think um, the large blue patch vessel is 
Yeah, I, I was just thinking about like using all of these things that I had in my studio and it's sort of just this like conglomeration of all of these different ceramic methods and materials. And I was thinking about it more like less as ceramic and more as like quilting pieces together. Um, well, it's kind of like a frugality in a way, I guess, like a sort of a little shaker frugality. Like if you're looking at um, taking, taking the patch uh, vessel in blue, and then if you sort of look at it next to the box covered with broom labels uh, from the Shaker Museum, um, you can kind of see this like patchwork sort of genius come through, I guess, or frugality of, of uh, you know, conservation of materials. What, what can you tell me about the, the box? But I just loved how simple this was and how it's like clearly made out of some sort of label. It's, a, it's their broom labels. And this sort of, uh, like, I don't know, like the the shakers sort of, they celebrated everything. Like even, this was like made out of, it's a super simple design. It's like made out of scrap material, but they had, they like put a little pattern on it and it's like very celebrated. So I thought that was really amazing. Um, and does, it shows, it it's an example of their frugality. Um, and yeah, sort of like, I don't know. I think it's like a, a little bit of a like genius. And also I like that it's broom labels because it's, um, it's also an example of how like business oriented they were. And, and Lisi, like of all of the pieces that are of Katie's that are going to be in the show, I guess, aside from the, from the new chairs, which one do you think, um, you know, if we could resurrect someone from uh, the 18th century on the Shaker movement to come to to see the pop up show, like what what do you think that they would be sort of the most, you know, um, drawn to, or what do you think that they would have the most to say about? Um, well, there's there will be two pieces. Or of they just burn Katie at the stake, and then then that would. Be Oh no, the Shakers would have loved Katie. <laughs> um, I think um, there's two two of Katie's chairs will be in the show. Um, those are the pieces that uh, the contemporary pieces that are there. It's a small space. Um, I think it would be. I, I think. Um, I think that the the Shakers their aesthetic really got. Um, hijacked a little bit uh, by the early collectors who had a vested interest in um, selling that furniture that they that they bought from the Shakers when the Shaker communities were in decline. Um, they they wanted to present it as very stark and modernist and that was the way that that was a story they told in order to to sell to sell a commodity basically. But I think what one of the things that Katie has um, revealed here through this show is that there's just way more to the story. I mean, you see photographs of their, the spaces they actually lived in, they were much more cluttered <laughs> um, than you would have been led to believe by by um, the sort of outside people who who took over that narrative. Um, and I, I think they would have loved, I think they would have loved the bonnet chairs. <laughs> Um, I think they, I think they would have recognized it and they thought, would have thought it was very, very cool. They were, they, they loved new things. They weren't, um, they weren't like the Amish or some other religious sects that, that don't like change. They were always on top of new technologies. Um, they would take new, new inventions and they would improve them. They would patent things. Um, they were always looking out for what were the newest ways to to farm and to keep livestock and things like that. I think they they would have been very into it. I often joke that if the Shakers were around today in the sort of, you know, there are there is a Shaker community that that exists in Maine now, but if they were as widespread as they were in the middle of the 19th century, they'd probably be doing things like like mining cryptocurrency. <laughs> that's a that's a very good point. Um Katie, I'm going to give you uh, give you the last word here. What um, what would you say is sort of like the one thing you would like a visitor to the pop up um, show know, or like what would you want their takeaway to be in terms of understanding your work and who you are? Um, and, okay, I guess 
Wow, I was like so ready for you to ask about like what the takeaway would be for the, about the shakers, not my work. All right, well, let's talk about your work first and then we'll go to the shakers. Yeah. Or we'll talk, let's talk about the shakers first and then, and then you can switch back. Well, I guess in terms of a takeaway about my work, like I just, I made these two chairs that are very much a reaction to shakers. And I'm not sure anyone would be able to understand like the full context of those two chairs about um, if they didn't know anything else, but maybe that's the whole point. And that's sort of the point of the show. It's like, we've only really seen, or a lot of us have only been exposed to this like one perspective on shaker furniture and design, which has been like super modernist and almost like patriarchal in a way. And like, uh, a little cold and the whole notion of purity just is like so freaky to me i hate it um and a lot of people put pure is a word that's like been used to describe shaker furniture like over and over and so i guess i'd want the takeaway to be um like there's always like another always another side to something um and that shaker furniture and shakers aren't they're like so much more than you know the shaker chairs that we see, like they were they were really freaky and cool. <laughs> um, there's like, I also don't think like they lived, yeah, I don't know. I was just also like super fascinated by how covered all of the furniture was that they used in like doilies and tchotchkes. Um, but I digress. I guess the takeaway would be like, knowing that there are multiple perspectives on things. And and about your own work, is that how you want people to to sort of view your lady lamps and fruit lady and the floor lamps is that it's not, it's more three-dimensional than, than maybe what it might appear to be at first glance? Exactly, yeah, because it's sort of like what you said at the beginning, like it seems like a, fun, like a, a surprising fit, like my work with shaker work. But I think it like totally makes sense if you just do like a little deep dive. Um, so yeah, that's the takeaway, I guess. Um, and with these chairs also, I was thinking about, um, I was just looking at them together and I was thinking about the shoes and the dancing that we talked about at first. And I really, I think the chairs in this funny way, they look, um, well, A, it sort of looks like, they look like partners, like one's like maybe a male and one's a female, but you can't quite tell like which is which or like if they really are gendered. And they sort of, um, they sort of look like they're about to like do a little dance together, which I like. Mm. And I don't know, to me that speaks to the Shaker community, sort of this like, um, I don't know, their progressive ideas on gender and uh, how like celebratory they were. Amazing. Um, is there anything that you guys wanted to mention or talk about before we wrap up? So, so the pop-up exhibition will be open in Chatham, New York. Um, uh, and it's Friday through Sunday on Main Street in a little storefront. Uh, and Chatham, New York is uh, going to be the new home of the new Shaker Museum. We're in the process of uh, building a new facility in downtown Chatham. We're working with the architect uh, Annabelle Seldorf on that. And we're excited to have a presence in the village of Chatham in advance of having our permanent year round home there in a few years. Amazing. Another reason to go up to Chatham. Katie, anything on your end? I mean, I can't really think of anything specific. I feel like I um, was just so inspired by everything I saw, and I, I could listen to Lacey talk about it forever. Um, no, I think, I think I'm going to have to uh, go buy a book on the Shakers um, right after this and then and start <laughs> to do more reading, because I, I do want to learn more about, you know, you know, how they were maybe the cryptocurrency <laughs> the cryptocurrency kings of of the 18th century um, is really like kind of a fascinating way of thinking about them in a in a totally non uh, 
in a totally new way that is like you as you said like not not just pre-modernists and and the sort of the story uh ends there um so thank you ladies thank you so much thank, thank you thank everyone to design miami and to the shaker museum and to katie and to our company and um and thank you for for asking me to be here and to and to speak with you guys